So this is Charles Jones. He is the head of our pottery department. And he is going to be with you for the next hour doing some hand building demonstrations. Charles, over to you. Okay, very good and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, the Under Edwards Pottery, which is in my basement of my house on Edwards Street in New Haven. So uh, I just welcome everybody and I uh, hope everybody's enjoying all their quarantine activities that we have going on. So I wanted to come up with something to uh, <clears throat> keep the pottery community uh, connected and uh, but also to show people some really simple techniques that uh, can be used uh, at home with a yeah, uh, uh, pretty high high level demonstration of hand building techniques and we're going to focus on some simple slab building and I'll show you a couple of ways to come up with some very interesting uh, pieces. So just to get started I'll show you some of the pieces that I'm talking about in an email that I sent out that went out to the pottery community from CAW. I had some pictures, but this, I'm gonna hold it out a little bit, a little awkward, but this is a little bowl, just very simple little bowl with a little rim on it. And if I get it close enough, you can see that there's some texture on uh, the rim. So <clears throat> then we have one that's a little more precise, very round, once again, with a, with a little bit of an overhang and a little bit of a lip and this one has the texture going all the way through the middle of the piece also. The texture is stamping. Okay. And to show you some of the variety, here's a square piece. Once again, you can see the overhang on the lip. Nice rounded curve on that. And once again, a lot of texture on the lip of the piece, but none in the center. And then just another one, a little more of a free form piece going on here. You see this one? I'll hold it up. Free form edges on the outside. And this one also has a textured clay added to the surface of the slab that gives it a very interesting uh, uh, texture on the surface of, of the piece right there. So one of the things I like about these uh, techniques is that they're very scalable. You can make very small pieces, like if you want to make a little tiny little wasabi tray or something like that, very easy to do, all the way up to relatively large pieces. I have one piece that I'll demonstrate that's a little bigger than the others just to show you some of the uh, uh, possibilities that are out there. So uh, I do want to say this is a little awkward for me. I'm just uh, talking to a little camera in front of me, uh, uh, not my normal teaching uh, uh, method. So uh, I hope everybody bear, bears with me a little bit if I go uh, uh, rambling off somewhere. So uh, with that being said, this is gonna be focused on, on slab building. So <clears throat> one of the things I just wanted to introduce people to is some of the simple ways to make slabs. Now, <clears throat> almost everybody knows how to make a slab. You just, most people get a, lump of clay, throw it down, roll it out with a rolling pin. And <clears throat> that's a, a perfectly nice way to make it. So I'm just gonna loosely cut a piece of clay here. Uh, the simple tools I'm gonna be using, simple cutoff wire, a little knife, a little tiny rolling pin. I've got some other larger rolling pins I'll be using. Uh, a fettling knife. I've often wondered what a fettle is, but this is for fettling. A needle tool. And uh, I've got some other tools that I'll show you as I'm working along, and I'll introduce you to those. Sponge. But those are just the basics. So these are things that you can very easily find around your house or find a substitute for. So with this piece of clay here, if we're going to just roll it out. I'm gonna need you to wait by the camera. Astrid, I'm getting yep. a little background conversation. Yep, I'm on it. Hang on. A lot of people, when they're making slabs, uh, they try to get too much out of each roll 
And it's really about a lot of little rolls to move the clay out. And one of the things that I see a lot of people struggling with when they're working with rolling a slab out is after they've made a couple of rolls, they don't realize it's been attached to the canvas that they're working on. <clears throat> now I work with lots of canvas and I also have here, you can, you can see it a little bit, but the board I'm working on is just a, a piece of plywood that's covered oddly enough with an old shower curtain and then covered with a piece of canvas. The shower curtain keeps the uh, water from soaking through the canvas and warping the board. So that's a nice layer to have there. Otherwise you have to keep re replacing the board periodically. Then on top of that, I also always have another layer or two of canvas. So I'm always working with canvas because that makes it easy for me to move the piece around and roll it in different directions. So this piece here has now been attached to the canvas, and if I try to roll it, it doesn't move much at all. But if I free it up from the canvas, put it back down, you can get a nice another roll that'll extend the slab out. But now I've got to free it up again. And I see a lot of people that just don't free the clay up from their canvas enough, then they're working just way too hard. So if you just keep rolling it and freeing it up, you'll get to a point that it gets pretty thin. At that point, you really need to be careful because if you try to pull it up, you'll very often start to rip it. And that's when you just want to have, if you have a longer piece of canvas or bed sheet or anything will work, uh, the tougher the, the cloth, the less stretch that the cloth will have. And so heavier canvas is better, but not necessary. But now I've got the piece, the clay is stuck to it. I'm just gonna flip it over, peel the canvas that's stuck to it off, and now I can roll the piece a little thinner. Now it's stuck to the canvas again, and I'll just do the same thing. I'll just flip it over and just keep rolling it thinner and thinner till I get to the, the thickness that I want. Now everybody always says, how thick does the clay need to be? And the clay needs to be as thick as you need it to be. So there is no <laughs> set gauge, but if you're just starting out, you don't want to have really thin clay because it, it gets very difficult to work with. It rips a lot. So work with clay. If you're starting out quarter inch, three eighths of an inch, something along there is a, is a good uh, uh, thickness to start with. So here I have my little piece of clay and I'm gonna just cut a little slab of it off. And here I have a little half round bisque mold. I threw this on the wheel and then I trimmed it. So it's just a little dome. And I'm just going to take this clay and I'm just going to lay it on top of that dome. Then I'm going to take another piece of uh, wood here. I have lots of little pieces of wood around and lots of paper. Now, one of the things I found is really good to use if you can find an old telephone book, which are really kind of hard to find these days, or any. Uh, like this is a uh, Aetna Medicare prescription select PDP that got sent to me in the mail, which of course I haven't read, but it is a great, it's all filled up with really cheap paper that's very absorptive, it's like newsprint, but it's like a tablet that you can just keep peeling pieces off of. So I'm gonna set that on this little piece of wood. I'm gonna drop this piece on top of it. And then we're just gonna let our friend gravity help us here. And I'm just gonna drop this piece, okay? That'll begin to form the clay around the dome. Got a couple little kinks in it, so I'm just straightening those out, getting some of the excess clay off. I'm hoping everybody can see everything fine here. I know it's a little far away, so you may be missing some of the details, but I'm just gonna drop this 
and that just forms the clay around the piece. Then I have this uh, custom made tool here, which is just a piece of flat foam that I've rolled up into a cylinder and then put a piece of masking tape on the end. And now I'm just gonna mash that in around the perimeter of that little dome. That'll squash the clay right up against the form. And using a piece of foam keeps you from getting little fingerprints all the way around there. It just spreads the force out. So then I've got that. Then deciding on how you want it to look, this one I'm gonna make it just very, uh, uh, kind of asymmetrical around there. So I'm just gonna cut around. Get all that excess clay off. Save it for later. Now here's my piece, but if I just leave it on, on here, I'll have the possibility, in fact, almost assuredly, that when it shrinks around the piece, it's gonna crack because the bisque mold isn't gonna shrink, but the clay will shrink as it dries. And if it can't crush the piece that it's around, it'll just crack. So at some point I'm gonna need to get it off of this. And because this is a demo, normally I would let it set up a couple of minutes, but I'm not gonna worry about it. So I'm gonna get another piece of wood. I'm gonna put the paper on top of it. I'm gonna lay this other piece of wood there. I'm gonna take this now and in my class, I always talk about the relationship between working with clay and the NASA space program, is that if you throw something up in the air, when it reaches the apex of its upward movement, it actually becomes weightless for a fraction of a second before it starts back down again. And that's when you turn it over. So now I have this piece turned over. I'll peel the top cloth off. I'll lift my little piece out. So now you have a little bowl with a little rim on it. Now, <clears throat> I could leave it just like this, but it'll rock a little bit. So I'm just gonna drop it just very lightly a couple of times. That'll flatten the bottom of the dome a little bit. And there you have very simple, very easy little bowl. Now, a lot of you are saying, I'm sure, geez, that'd be great if I hadn't had a bisqueware mold at home. I could make a lot of those. But <clears throat> this is just something that I made because it was really easy. You can do all kinds of stuff and use the same thing. You can get a tennis ball and cut it in half with a razor knife. Be very careful. But uh, if you can go to uh, Joann's or this and uh, some of the other uh, craft stores, Michael's or these types of things, you can find styrofoam balls that will stick to the clay, they'll texture the clay a little bit, but if you wrap them really tightly with really thin plastic, you can get the same effect from this too. So it's really just a matter of looking around and finding things that'll work. So this gives you a very simple little, little bowl. And a lot of people say, kind of boring, you could glaze it really funny and uh, get all kinds of action on the glaze. But another thing to do, I'm just going to move this over to my storage area over here. <clears throat> Would be to do something very similar with a piece of clay. And here, I've got a piece of clay. I want to make a, a slab. Same thing again. It's not big enough. So I'm just going to widen this piece of clay a little bit just by hammering it. This also sticks it to the canvas, so I free it up. Start from the middle and work your way out, and then it'll just move the clay out. And this is just another technique. I could have just used a rolling pin again, but I'm trying to show you some other stuff. So now I've got this guy. It's not level, it's not flat. But if I take my wire tool and I hold my wire tool very tightly and instead of pressing it down with my fingertips right onto the canvas, I'm gonna kind of put it behind my thumbs so that it's about a quarter inch from the tips of my thumbs. I hope you can see that. I know it's, it's virtually invisible 
on camera. But if I hold this down now, <clears throat> the wire is being held off the uh, canvas about a quarter of an inch. And if I just run this through, it'll give me a little bit of a slab. Of course, I gotta put some weight on the canvas. And this will give me a slab that's a little more even. It's a little thicker than I want it, but still workable. And now I've got a slab, but I can also put some texture on it. And you can texture with all kinds of stuff. Uh, here's a stick. I'm gonna texture this with a stick just by whacking it in a very artistic way. Kind of in a little circle. And there I have some texture on this slab. Once again, trying to give you a little feck there. So hope you can see that. Then I'll do the same thing again with my little piece of wood, my little piece of paper, my little slab. I lay this on top of it. It's a little asymmetrical. I'm gonna cut what I know is gonna be really excess clay off of this. Now here, instead of just dropping it, I'm gonna lightly form it around, just with a little quacker packer motion here. And once again, a lot of people, when they're working with slabs, try to get the slabs to move too fast. And you really need to do, you know, a hundred little motions rather than five big motions to get the clay to move. So here we have it. Now I can decide on this one, I'm gonna to try to do a little more of a geometric design on this to play off of the uh, stick uh, marks that I made. The little texture has kind of a geometric design to it. So I'm gonna do this a little more angular. And I'm gonna get my other little piece, another piece of paper, use a lot of paper. And I use the paper to keep the clay from sticking to anything. So it, it creates a barrier between the different uh, pieces. So I don't worry about them sticking together. Oh, uh, that's a beauty. So here you have the piece. I, here, I'll try to turn it up a little bit. See how it's got a nice angle to it, but it's got a lot of nice texture on there. Okay. Just had my production assistant come in and told me that my clay weight was in the way. So, but you can see that this is uh, very different than this one where you've got a lot more texture, a lot more um, action going on. The possibilities for these things are really endless as you're moving forward. So real simple, very direct, nice little tiny pots. These are particularly fun because you can make a lot of them very, very quickly. And this is really good if you wanna, if you wanna have a nice shape to practice uh, glazing on. So here's a slab that's about the size that I need it to be for these shapes. I'm just gonna whack it down. And then this is the most common way that I make my slabs. I use spacer sticks. So these are plexiglass. I like them because I never get splinters from these. I'm gonna lay them down beside the clay. And then I'm just gonna get a wire tool, hold it very tight, taut. I always say taunt, and that's apparently incorrect. So you're welcome, Libby, if you're listening. 
So I'm gonna hold this wire very tight, hold it right down on the plexiglass, pull it through, and this will leave me with a slab that is as thick as my uh, spacers. Now, <clears throat> in my little basement workshop, I have got these little guys, which are uh, 16 inch thick plastic that I found one day as I was uh, uh, going through uh, uh, bulk trash. I cut it into these strips and I can just layer these up in 16 inch increments to get a slab exactly the thickness that I want it just by, just by pulling it through here. I also have multiples of the quarter inchers. I've got three eighths, I've got one eighths, I've got all kinds of little slabs here, but it's very easy to get to the uh, thickness that you want just by doing that. So now I have this little slab. I can throw it down very quickly. I've got my piece again. I can decide what I want to do here. I make a lot of stamps. This is a bisquare stamp that I just made very quickly. I've got like hundreds of these around my workshop. I'll show you how to make them really quick. Get a little tiny ball of clay. This is not rocket science. A little tiny ball of clay. I'm just gonna whack it down. Then I'm just gonna pinch up a little handle on it. Then I'm gonna get something, whatever I feel like, whatever I've got lying around to make a design on it. So this is real simple. This is just a simple wood tool and I'm just gonna make some marks in it. I, I like really bold marks on my stamps. A lot of people make very thin stamps and a lot of the texture gets lost. So I'm just gonna do this. So very simple design, just a bunch of parallel lines and then a couple of diagonal lines, but it's not flat anymore. So now I'm just gonna pat it flat. I'm gonna look at the design again. The patting it flat often changes the design. So I'm just gonna refine it just a little bit. Then I'm gonna pat it flat again. And normally I would wait until it was dry and then I would shape the outside edge of the stamp to get it to, you know, uh, accentuate the design on the inside. But I'm not gonna worry about this one. So very quickly, now I have a little square stamp. I will fire that and then it will come out and it will look like this. Now, the nice thing about a bisque stamp is that I can uh, stamp it multiple times. It doesn't stick on the clay, at least for a little while, as soon as it gets saturated with moisture from the clay, it'll begin to stick to the clay, but until that happens, it'll release pretty easily. So here I've made a little circle of my design. I'll get another piece of paper. I'll put it down. I'll get my little guy there. I'll lay this on top of it. I'll do a real quick little mash down. I'll drop it. I'll get my little foam guy. I'll pat it in. I'll make a decision what I want the lip to look like. Now I could get a banding wheel and put this on it and center it and then have just cut a little circle around it and it would look a uh, uh, little more precise. I, I kind of like the more rough edges, so I'm just gonna freehand it. So without much work at all, 
<clears throat> much time, I should say, you can very quickly end up with multiple versions of this little bowl shape. Once again, here's one, hopefully that'll stick. And you'll see the design goes all the way around the edge. So very quickly, we've made three, four of these guys in like, you know, 20 minutes. And once you get going, you can rip these things out really quickly. This is a great shape to use if you <clears throat> want to try different glazes, you want to see how glazes work out, you end up with a little bowl, nice little test tile, and you can also work on your uh, uh, different glazing techniques because you have a little bit of a flat surface, a little bit of a curved surface, exterior uh, uh, curves also. So nice little piece to practice glazing on. So I'll throw this out of the way. So that's a simple one. Very simple, <clears throat> using a drape mold, letting it smack down, and you end up with a nice little shape. So the things to remember, uh, nice to have a coil of foam to mash down. It keeps getting fingerprints all over the base of the piece. Uh, <clears throat> Start collecting little shapes that are good to uh, drape clay over so that uh, you can make all different kinds of uh, designs. And the next one I'm gonna show you is a variation of this, but we're gonna use just a little square piece of wood. Okay, so this one, once again, <clears throat> I'll get my slab out, I'll get my guy. Now because this <clears throat> guy is a little bigger, I'm going to cut this one a little thicker so I can stretch it out. So I'll get my spacers here. And then <laughs> this is a tool I use a lot. Once again, not absolutely necessary. This is a just three pieces of wood. I got nails in here to hold these guys. I've got a wire tool on the bottom and just a wire up at the top with just a, a little eye hole with a, a, a wing nut on it so I can tighten the top, which brings the top together, which expands the bottom and makes the uh, wire uh, nice and tight. Okay, so I'm gonna hold this here. I'm just gonna pull it through. That'll give me a real quick cut. It's a little thicker, so now I can roll it a little bit. I'll get my rolling pin out. Ah, exciting. So now I have one that's just as thick as those spacers that were there. And I'm actually going to use a smaller little block of wood. So this is a little tiny block of wood. This is a piece of paper that I've cut that's the same size as the piece of wood. And I do that just by putting the piece of wood on a piece of paper and cutting around it with a razor knife. So not rocket science here. But this tells me exactly where the middle of the piece is gonna be. So if I wanna texture this, I can now know exactly where the edges of the piece are gonna be. And I can stay away from the middle if I don't want any texture in the middle of the piece. So I'm just bearing down on these guys. Very simple little design. Use a slightly bigger piece of wood. I got all kinds of wood around my uh, my workshop and I save them out because uh, I know I'm gonna use them for stuff. So this guy, once again, piece of paper goes down, piece of wood goes on it. Now I've got to figure out, oh, put that piece of wood there. Put this guy over here. 
put this guy on top. And you'll see why I'm doing this in just a second. So now when I turn this over, I know that my slab is right over the piece of paper. And I'm doing that so the wood won't stick to the clay. But I also have this nicely centered on my design. So now, hopefully you can see this all really nicely. I'm gonna get a rolling pin and I'm not gonna roll hard at all. I'm gonna roll very gently just over the edge and just let the weight of the rolling pin kind of move the clay a little bit. Then I'm gonna do the other side. Then I'm gonna go back and do the first sides again. Now I'm gonna just bang it up against the side of the pot a little bit. So it's banging up against the wood form until I get a nice shape. Now what this is doing is creating a curve on the side of the piece that's got the same curvature as the rolling pin. Now, <clears throat> whenever I go to tag sales or anything like that, I look for every rolling pin I can find because they're all slightly different diameters. And depending on the shape I'm making, I can get rolling pins of different diameters. And I've even got great big uh, uh, PVC pipe that comes in all different diameters too. So I can use those to bang up against it. So now I'm gonna get this guy. And <clears throat> on forms that I make a lot, or just because I like tools and I like to make things, I've made little jigs where I've got the wood block permanently attached to a piece of wood and I've got lines on the wood so I know what parallel is if I want to do parallel. And uh, this has been an interesting little innovation and I do all kinds of stuff to keep it from sticking and everything. But after a while, uh, you begin to learn what you really like. And here I'm just gonna cut this off relatively evenly around the edge. And because I've got it on a piece of paper, it's not sticking to that piece of uh, wood that I've got it, uh, that I'm working it on. So now I've got that guy squared away. I would do the same thing I do all the time. Get this guy. Get another piece of wood. Now I'm just, you know, lift it up and flip it over. Catch it on the way down. Now, if I didn't have that piece of paper in the middle, this piece would stick pretty, could stick very uh, solidly to this wood block and it'd be very hard to get the wood block out. But right now, you can see this. I've got, I'm hoping you can see that design on there. And nice little piece. A lot of people, I just leave the paper in there until it dries, it doesn't bother anything. But very simple little design, but very elegant really in a lot of ways. And this is how I made this piece which you'll see the, the angle that you get from the rolling pin. And then the texture on the surface, which I, I'm a real big fan of uh, stamps and texture. I really enjoy that visually. So this very quickly will get you to uh, a nice piece. And you can see how just by changing the shape of the piece, the depth of the piece, you can make larger bowls using larger rolling pins and everything. You could make actually pretty substantially sized pieces using this very simple and very direct approach using very simple tools and techniques. So I'm going to show you one more because this was something that I struggled with for a long time where this piece, is round, 
And I was struggling with how to get the rolling pin to whack up against the side of the piece without making little dents and to make it nice and even. And I, I just could not come up with a solution to that for a long time. And uh, I, 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 a friend of mine, Melissa, maybe she may be listening, and uh, really pissed me off when uh, she was walking by one day as I was struggling with this and I'm showing her how it doesn't work out. And <laughs> I've been trying to figure a solution for this for several weeks. And she walks by and she goes, why don't you use a ball? And I thought, yeah, okay, fine, we'll do that. And uh, it turns out that the ball works great. And uh, it also gave me an opportunity to go out and start looking for all different sizes of balls wood balls of all shapes and sizes because you never know what you're going to need when you're uh, size you're going to need when you're making one of these pieces so <clears throat> last piece i'm going to make this was, this was a piece of wood that came out of another wood project i was doing i forget what that project was but i ended up with this little football piece of scrap and <clears throat> normally uh, Back when I was a carpenter, I just would have thrown this out because it's a pretty useless piece of scrap, except it's really a nice little mold for uh, doing pottery on. So with this one, I did the same thing. I cut a piece of paper that fits right on it. And we're gonna need a larger slab for this. So I'm just gonna... Get this guy. One thing I like about pottery is that I'm just able to work out a lot of aggression. And it's just a wonderful way to relax, just to get things for a while, not worry about it. So I'll just see how this fits. So I need it to be a little bit bigger. So I get rid of a little more aggression here. And here I'll just roll it with my rolling pin. So that guy is stuck there. I will get some of my longer little slabs here. I'll get my handy dandy little wire cutter tool. And once again, you can just do this just by manually doing it, but uh, I try to do everything I can to make my life as easy as possible, and this makes it easy. Oh, sorry, looks like the camera moved. Not sure what's going on. Hang on, everybody. He'll be right back. It looks like it flipped around, Secret. I, I mean, uh, uh, Astrid. Astrid. I, 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 I didn't do anything, so I'm not sure why it did that. Let me see. Is what there I a, can do. a button to flip your screen? Yeah, hang on. I see it. Oh, wait.
How's that? Okay. Good. <clears throat> that uh, one other thing I wanted to show you is a lot of people when they're working with slabs get a lot of texture on the slab when they cut or something that they don't like or they've made a mistake or they put a mark on it. And you can buy these little tools. They're just uh, uh, wallpaper tools or painting tools. And there's this version, there's long versions of this, but you can just drape, uh, scrape this along your slab and just really smooth out any marks that you don't like. So I'm gonna put my little piece of paper there that tells me where everything is. And then I can go to one of my little uh, handy dandy little guys. I don't know what I did with my... <laughs> I was looking for a little texture device, but I'm going to use this little rolling pin. And I'm just going to go all the way around this piece. just making little marks with the edge of this rolling pin. Now I actually have a whole uh, bins of textured rollers. I'm real big on uh, uh, toy tires from cars and stuff, uh, old foot rollers massage things that you can take apart. So anything that got texture on it, uh, I have no idea what this thing is, but it's got little spikes all over it. But all of those things can be used to roll a texture around a piece. So this guy, I'm now gonna center that on that slab. I've made a horrible mistake here Can you hear me now, Astrid? Yep, all good, Charles. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on, guys, because I'm not doing anything. I'm not touching anything, so. But <clears throat> I've made a mistake here where I, I have this big slab, but it's not on a board that I can flip over. So I'm gonna <clears throat> have to squeeze the board underneath it. And that's another good reason to always be working on a piece of canvas, is I can just slide a board underneath that piece of canvas And I'll get another board, another piece of newspaper. I've lost my little book. There it is. So a couple of pieces of paper on that. I'm sure that'll work. What could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> Flip it over. And now I'll get my little ball. So I've got my little ball here. I'll do my little wacky packy thing to lightly pack it around. And then I'll just roll this ball. And it's, it's often good to start with a larger ball to get it going and then move down to the smaller ball as you get closer to your final shape. So here, I'm gonna go to the smaller ball now. That'll give me a smaller uh, curvature on the side of the piece, which is what I'm looking for. And I'll just rotate this guy around.
And you got to be very gentle when you're using the ball because it's really easy to get dents if you don't do it very well. But on the plus side, you can't really see enough detail to know that. So uh, uh, I can just tell you it's perfect. So it's perfect. So here, I'll just very quickly do a rough cut around this. Oops, that did not seem like it was the right angle. Peel these guys away. Find me my paper. Yeah, I spend most of my time looking for my tools when I'm working in my basement because uh, I put things down, I put things aside, I put things over, I lay things on top of things. And a lot of time is spent just looking for things. So this guy is there. We'll flip him over, lift this guy up. And one of the things to be careful of when you're taking that top piece off to lift it up straight, because if you lift it off to the side, it'll bend the one edge of your lip down. So there's this piece, this guy gets pulled out. And this is what can happen sometimes with these pieces is even though the, the paper's there, it'll stick on the edge and uh, you got to work it out slowly. But there you have a very interestingly shaped piece mm -hmm. like that. with some design on the uh, lip right there and hard to do that any other way. So those were the main things I was going to demonstrate tonight and uh, uh, just kind of give everybody a good feel for what's going on. You can see how these could be applicable to so many different shapes once you have the basic technique done, down that you can just drape clay over pretty much any shape. And the nice thing about this is it will very often give you a nice little hard edge on the inside of your piece, which I find quite pleasing. And the other thing that I will mention, uh, to give your piece a little more of a finished edge, a finished appearance, and to make it easier to glaze, is before you take it off of this piece, before you turn it over, get your little roller guy and just go around this edge. Thankfully, I have more than one of those. I got some clay in the uh, in the uh, axle, and it was stopping it from rolling. So now, if I just roll around this edge very gently, it will create a little forty-five degree angle, which is really a little foot, and it gives you a a a. a a very distinct line to glaze to and to wax to that will give you about a quarter of an inch uh, separation from the kiln shelf and the bottom of your piece. Plus it just makes the piece look a lot more finished on the bottom. Uh, one thing I will tell you is that one nice thing about uh, uh, working with slabs is uh, uh, very easy to finish the bottoms. You don't have to do a lot of stuff. But you can also jazz these pieces up very quickly by putting little feet on them before you turn them back over. This one won't, won't work because it's, it's too big, but I'll show you the, the general idea is that if I decided to put little feet on this, and you would score it and slip it and do all that kind of stuff too. I'm not gonna go over all the different techniques and everything, but just if you were to attach feet to this, like this, and then you know make them very decorative and everything and beautiful and incredibly nice, which would take longer than this. And then 
once again, get your paper on there, get your piece of wood. And when you have feet on them, now's the time to make it level. So I'm just pressing down on this, which is flattening the feet and making them all level. I'll turn this over. And now I've got something that used to be just a simple little tray, but now it's an elegant little guy with great little feet on the bottom, which just jacks this puppy up a whole lot. So the possibilities of these techniques are really endless. And, and they're, they're actually quite simple, but can create very complex and beautiful pieces by just applying them uh, in very creative ways. So that's what I hope you guys got something out of this. I think I'm right about at an hour from uh, when we started. Uh, the clock that I had working down here uh, uh, decided to stop like just before I started doing this session and the clock that I, I have uh, says it's a uh, one twelve. <laughs> so uh, Astrid, I think we're pretty well squared away. Uh, yep. If anybody has questions or something, I'll be happy to throw out uh, uh, some clarifications or anything. But before I do that, I just wanted to say to everybody that joined in, thank you very much. I hope you guys can use some of this. Uh, we'll be sending out some additional information for people about uh, future uh, workshops that we'll be having, future demonstrations. And... Uh, and where you might be able to actually, even if, if you don't have access to clay directly, uh, we'll be sending out some recommendations of clay that you can order so that you can have some stuff to work with in your house because all this can easily be done on your kitchen table. Okay, take it away, Astrid.